Okay, thanks, Amber. Uh, so I'm going to continue our presentation and talk about another aspect of the study. Okay, so uh, we've done a lot of different things with this project. Uh, we've done some greenhouse gas emissions work. Uh, we've done some deep core sampling uh, work to kind of look at how nutrients move throughout uh, time with multiple applications. And then another thing that we did was to look at using the soil health tool uh, for looking at nutrient management and also as an indicator of soil health in these fields that had received uh, quite a bit of manure application over time and also uh, using it in an irrigated calcareous system, which is a little bit different than what it's been used for in the past. So if those of you who are not familiar with the soil health tool, it was a test that was uh, developed by Rick Haney, and it's a soil testing method that's really geared towards estimating not only the available nutrients in the soil uh, right now, but what the effects would be of soil microbial activity over the growing season on nutrient availability. And I was really interested in it from that standpoint because our soils out here uh, tend to produce a lot of nitrogen throughout the growing season just naturally. So our control soils can mineralize up to 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre in any given growing season. So I was really kind of excited about trying the tool to see if it would do a better job of predicting the nutrients that would be available over the growing season. And the idea behind that is if you can predict what's going to be available, Hopefully that will allow you to better manage the nutrients that you're putting on the fields to reduce the total amount of nutrients that are going onto fields. So this test basically involves either water extractable organic carbon, nitrogen, or water extractable inorganic nitrogen. It looks at the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the two, understanding that that can have a big impact on uh, soil microbial activity in the soil also uses a Solvito microbial activity test, as well as inorganic NP and K, and a weak acid extraction, aluminum, iron, and phosphorus. And so these tests are supposed to reflect the complex, eco complex ecosystem of the soil, instead of just depending on what we would typically measure uh, pre-season, which would be your inorganic NP and K. And this test also includes a soil health calculation, which is supposed to represent the overall health of your soil system. Again, looking at basically microbial activity and some of the organic compounds uh, that would be in the soil. And these soil health scores can val uh, vary anywhere from zero to 50. The national average is about 9.3. Um, keeping track of this number will theoretically allow you to gauge the effects of your management practices over the years. Uh, however, it was developed in Texas and tested in Texas uh, and was not really developed for our irrigated calcareous soils or for irrigated systems. So uh, we kind of wanted to test this because a lot of people are interested in using it out here and there's been a lot of uh, pressure on some of the labs to offer this test. And so people wanted to see whether or not it would perform very well in our particular situation. So we wanted to look at two aspects of it. The first was the nutrient management aspect and looking at NP and K uh, predictions over time. And so the available nitrogen using this test is based on water extractable ammonium and nitrate, as well as this component that looks at the organic nitrogen in the soil and microbial activity, uh, which is supposed to give you an idea of how much nitrogen might become available over the season. And then they use this factor of four which is an estimate of the number of significant rainfall events you would expect to see over the season. And this is supposed to give you an idea of how wetting and drying the soils affects microbial activity and might reflect the release of these nutrients over time. It also looks at available phosphorus using a weak acid extract, as well as this component of organic pea uh, and how much would be released by microbes over the growing season and available potassium based on the weak extract. Uh, weak acid extract of potassium. And so ultimately the NPK that you need each year would be based on that amount needed by the crop based on whatever yield goal, subtracting what would be in the soil using these soil tests and therefore that would tell you uh, what you would need. And the idea is if you can predict the nutrients that are going to be available over the growing season, this should help you reduce 
the total amount of nutrients that are being put on these plots. But for us, this value of four, which looks at the significant number of rainfall events, is kind of uh, not very representative of what we would have here. Because during the growing season, especially once you get uh, some heat in July and August, we're irrigating every day. So the number of wetting and drying events we would have over the season would be quite a bit higher than what you would have uh, in a natural rain-fed system. So again, we looked at this tool on field data from uh, the long-term in North study that Amber was just speaking about, and we did three years worth of um, soils. So I think we had 14, 15, and 16. And then we also looked at another long-term manure study where we were using the same manure either applied in the spring or fall along with compost and um, two fertilizer treatments. So if we look at predicting nitrogen availability, and these next several graphs are going to have the numbers for the soil health tool on the x-axis and what we measured uh, pre-plant sampling on the y-axis, you can see that the soil health tool in this case, uh, it was somewhat related to our potassium chloride extractable nitrate and ammonium that we would typically uh, use to predict how much nitrogen to put out that year. But our inorganic nitrogen numbers were twice what they saw, uh, what we saw with the soil health tool. So even though the tool was trying to predict um, this extra nitrogen that would be released, over the season, uh, what we found is that it didn't even predict the amount that we would typically see with our regular pre-plant uh, inorganic nitrogen testing. So then we wanted to look at this other factor that the soil health tool has, which is where uh, they have a column for added N. And this added N is supposed to represent the amount of nitrogen that would be mineralized over the growing season. And we compared that to our mineralizable nitrogen that we do in 100 day incubation period, uh, which is, gives us an idea of how much nitrogen we would expect to be released over the growing season. And again, what we found was that the mineralizable nitrogen was estimated to be about 12 times less using the soil health tool calculations compared to what we saw with our typical laboratory incubations. And so to look at what the crop is seeing out in the field, we were looking at the soil health tool uh, nitrogen in pounds per acre here on the X versus what the plants were taking up on the Y. And to be fair, uh, it's probably best to look at the low and the high end of the scale because we did apply nutrients um, to these treatments in the middle. But you can see even in uh, our control plots where we applied no added uh, nitrogen throughout the season, that the soil health tool was estimating pretty low amounts of nitrogen would be available while the crops uh, we're taking up quite a bit of nitrogen. So even though the soil health tool is not seeing the nitrogen, the plants were definitely taking it up. We looked at using uh, the tool to predict P availability. And you can see this is uses the weak acid and the organic microbial based uh, P here on the X axis compared to what we typically use, which is Olson P on the Y axis. Although there was a really good relationship between the two tests, uh, the soil health tool predicted 11 times less available P uh, than we do with just our traditional soil testing. Therefore, if we had gone uh, with these numbers, we would have been adding a lot more uh, phosphorus fertilizer than we would using our traditional soil test methods. And again, looking at P availability, even our control plots where the soil health tool is predicting really low amounts of available phosphorus. The plants were seeing uh, quite a bit of phosphorus and taking up quite a bit. And lastly, looking at the potassium availability, uh, you can see there was a really good relationship between uh, the soil health tool potassium and our pre-plant potassium, which we use the Olson extraction method. But again, the soil health tool predicted, in this case, nine times less available that's just a potassium than the traditional tests indicated. So all in all, in terms of NP and K, using the soil health tool uh, actually showed that we had less available nutrients in the soil than when we use our standard pre-plant testing. And therefore, that would increase the amount of fertilizer uh, that would have been recommended for these fields. 
And again, you can see even on control plots where the soil health tool was predicting very low amounts of potassium, the plants had plenty of potassium to take up. And so I wanted to look at the other aspect, which is the soil health score. And to me, uh, when I think of healthy soils, I think about a number of different factors, how productive they are, how stable they are, how they help protect our water and air and support habitat. And so we ran the soil health score on all these different uh, plots from the multiple years, and you can see them laid out here. And the national average is about 9.3, although if you look at the spreadsheet, what it says is that you're really looking for a value of about seven or above. And it really looks like when you do this, that our soils are not particularly in the healthy category. And we did find this uh, 20 years ago when they used to talk about soil quality, uh, that one of the issues is that if you happen to be in the uh, Midwest, and you have these small cell type soils that have a lot of organic carbon in your soil quality, or in this case, your soil health scores tend to be pretty high. And as you move away from that, especially out to the arid west, where we don't have as much organic carbon in our soils, our scores tend to be pretty low. But one of the things that we always look at is production. So if you look at production in the Midwest of some of the main crops, I went with wheat, corn, grain, and corn silage here, if you look in Texas where the test was developed, you can see in Idaho, even though our soils tend to score low on the soil health scale, we tend to be just as productive or more productive for a lot of the major crops than these other areas where you would typically find higher scores. And one of the main reasons for this is that the soil health score is really directly related to soil carbon. And this isn't true with just this test. This is true with a lot of the tests that I've seen in the past is that as your carbon is increasing, uh, you tend to get higher soil health scores. And it made me stop and think and say, well, is this soil that we have out here really a lot healthier than this soil down here at the low end of the range? And so we wanted to look at some of the indicators. So Amber kind of showed this uh, data in a table before, but one of the things we did look at was how soil health score was changing with soil properties. And in this case, you can see that as the soil health score was going up, things like bulk density were going down, our total porosity was increasing, our moisture was increasing. So with the addition of carbon with all these manure treatments, we did have a positive effect on some of the measured soil physical parameters. But one of the things a lot of our guys are gonna ask is, well, what did it do for productivity? And so if we look at yield versus the soil health score, you can see in most cases, even though our health score is going up, we did not necessarily see any increase in yield. So it seemed to be uh, independent of soil health score in this case. But we have to look at other indicators in the soil as well. And uh, Amber mentioned several of these earlier. But one of the trends, and this would be the soil health score on the x-axis and uh, some other indicators on the y-axis. So for instance, Olson P is a pretty big concern for our producers out here as they are, uh, at least the dairymen are regulated by Olson P in the soil. And as you can see, as your soil health score is increasing, your Olson P is going up dramatically. And here at 20 parts per million is the agronomic level where you don't expect to see a response. Here at 40 is the threshold where if you get above that, you're not uh, allowed to apply phosphorus in many cases. So as your soil health score was increasing, you were starting to have a problem uh, with your Olson P. And you see another similar relationship with Olson potassium as your soil health score in this case is increasing, your potassium levels are getting uh, quite high and that can be a real problem for forage quality and looking at milk fever. Other indicators that Amber mentioned, uh, your EC, electrical conductivity, which is the indicator of salt, sodium absorption ratio. Again, as your soil health score was going up in these cases, uh, your EC and other negative indicators in the soil were also going up. So if you have salt uh, sensitive crops, you can start getting yourself into a situation where you may have problems over time. And uh, so it's really important to keep in mind that the amendment that you use to increase your soil carbon and therefore your soil health score is really important. You know, if you're using cover crops or other green manures, you're probably not gonna see these issues. 
but the use of manure, while it's good in many cases, if it's applied at really heavy rates over time, it can increase your soil health score, but can also have other detrimental impacts on other important characteristics. Uh, one of these other characteristics relates to crop quality, as Amber had said before, as we were increasing our soil health score, which would be at the higher levels of manure application rates, we were seeing not only a decrease in sugar in sugar beets, but also an increase in braid nitrate, which is a, a contaminant and a problem for our growers. And with malt barley, where you want to keep your proteins lower, as your soil health score was going up, you were getting into this range where you may have a problem uh, getting your barley accepted by the contractor that you're growing for. And Amber did uh, kind of show some of our lodging problems and our heavier application rates, but as you're applying more carbon and manure, uh, you're also increasing the potential for lodging in some of these heavier rate plots. So to wrap this all up, uh, the soil health tool consistently underestimated the amount of available nutrients in the soil which would actually lead to higher recommended nutrient application rates compared to what we would be getting with our standard tests. And one of the questions uh, that we can look at is this effect of repeated irrigations. And maybe we need to account for that if you're gonna use a tool similar to this and how that's affecting microbial activity over the season. We also have to be careful when using a soil test to really look at soil health as it doesn't always account for things like production, erosion potential, or other negative impacts that we could have on soil quality. So in this case, rising Olsen P, uh, potassium, EC, SAR, et cetera. And particularly in manure systems, an increasing soil health score does not necessarily mean that your soil is getting healthier. In some cases, you could actually be getting less healthy or creating more problems uh, due to extra things that come along with the carbon in manure, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and salt. So these things are all really important uh, to think about. <laughs>